By the way, uh, questions will be and discussion will be at the end of this session. Uh, this lecture was what we call in German Kurz und Krafti, right? so <coughs> short and uh, focused. Thank you very much for that. And uh, the second uh, paper will be by Professor Frank Salame, uh, who is an associate professor of Near Eastern Studies and assistant chairperson of the Department of Slavic and Eastern Languages and Literatures at Boston College. His main areas of research and teaching include minority narratives and the formation of the modern Middle East. His work and scholarship in the past decade have focused primarily on language, philology, cultural history and the history of ideas in the Middle East, and comparative literatures and intellectual traditions of the states of the Levant. He's founding editor-in-chief of the Levantine Review and author of Language, Memory, and Identity in the Middle East, The Case for Lebanon, which was published in 2010, uh, Charles Coram, an intellectual biography of a 20th century Lebanese, Lebanese young Phoenician, also from 2015, and The Other Middle East, an anthology <coughs> of Levantine literature, uh, published this year by Yale University Press. Uh, this paper is part of his ongoing research on the Jews of Lebanon, titled Lebanon's Jewish Community, Fragments of Lives Arrested. And his paper uh, will be about Lebanese Jews between rootedness and the exile, braving World War II, the Holocaust, and their aftermath. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Mehman. Thank you uh, to the organizers, to the Ben Zvi, uh, to Dr. Sadun, to uh, especially to Tamar, who put up with all of my frantic emails, and uh, to my friend and mentor, who shall remain unnamed, who probably whispered my name for me to get the invite to come here. Um, in, may I, in, in the tradition of good Middle Easterner, may I buy two minutes from Stefan because he didn't use the entire 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. In the context of Middle Eastern Jewry in modern times, seldom is there anything uh, mentioned beyond the cursory about the Jews of Lebanon. And if at all acknowledged, they're usually identified mainly in the context of Maronite Zionist relations during and immediately following the mandate period or within larger themes dealing with the destruction of European Jewry, the establishment of the State of Israel, and the prevalent narratives about the uh, expulsions of Jews uh, from Arab lands post-1948. Now, these aren't necessarily unworthy topics, but I think that in the context of uh, Lebanese Jewry, uh, they often distract more uh, than they may illuminate. Uh, for one, uh, the Lebanon of the first half of the 20th century was not an Arab state in the traditional sense, in the traditional interpretation of an Arab state. Uh, Lebanon did not consider itself to be uh, an Arab state, and indeed many Lebanese then, like now, may take great umbrage at being folded within uh, that label as being Arabs. Therefore, what might have befallen the Jews of Arab lands in the shadow of the Holocaust certainly did not apply in the case of Lebanon and Lebanese Jewish life during that period uh, appears to have been markedly different from Jewish life elsewhere in the Arab-defined Middle East. Consequently, Lebanese Jews, their stories, their status, their sociocultural production, and their political allegiances cannot and indeed ought not be folded into the same complex of events and circumstances as other Jews in the Middle East. In this sense, although naturally preoccupied with the goings-on in the nearby Yishuv, the Zionist project, and news of the destruction of European Jewry, Lebanese Jews of the first half of the 20th century had their own fish to fry, so to speak. They were by and large invested in their Lebanese experiment, competing for their place in Lebanese society and preoccupied with issues pertaining to their own piece of the pie in Lebanon's fractious system of uh, power sharing. 
evidence reveals that not unlike Lebanon's Christians, the Jews of Lebanon were heavily invested in the idea of a Lebanese Republic as a confederation of minorities rather than as an Arab state. Uh, and like their Maronite friends, uh, they did make a, a lot of noise, although at times discreetly, in order to uh, take part in, in, in uh, this exercise. On September 1st, 1920, General Henri Gouraud, the High Commissioner of the French Republic, brought into being uh, a modern Lebanese state expressly designed as a refuge for Near Eastern minorities. In his words, Gouraud was ushering in, quote, a greater Lebanon rooted in its past, eminent in its future, a single nation united in all of its diversity with all of its faith communities, true to the subtle character and skill of its Phoenician forefathers, this Lebanon is conceived to benefit everyone and is put in place to harm and disadvantage absolutely no one." End quote. Indeed, in some Lebanese Maronite quarters, there was a prevalent assumption that Adolphe Cremieux himself might have played a role in the establishment of modern Lebanon as a refuge for minorities. It was Cremieux often boasted a, uh, a Maronite patriarch, Maronite patriarch Anthony Arida, who uh, had his tenure until 1955, I believe. Uh, Arida argued that it was Cremieux who uh, urged French authorities back in 1860 uh, to come to the aid of the Maronites in Lebanon, who were then being decimated by the Druze during a uh, civil war in the mountain. And this uh, essentially uh, laid the foundation of a special regime for Mount Lebanon, which over time gave birth to uh, the modern state in 1920, as laid out by uh, uh, Gouraud. Lebanese Christians were particularly sensitive to the story, and Lebanese Jews also staked uh, claim to it and to a Lebanon, which they also vicariously began seeing as a Jewish handiwork. It was a state, uh, in the words of one of its founding fathers, another Maronite patriarch who came earlier, that, that was founded, quote, to be home uh, where Jews and others would be free to practice the rituals of their cultural, spiritual, and historical accretions, even and especially those setting them apart from neighboring groupings in terms of language, customs, trends, and cultural orientation." End quote. It was in order to celebrate and serve this Lebanon specifically that the first issue of Al-Alam al-Israeli, uh, l'univers israelite, uh, the uh, what would become the mouthpiece of Lebanon's uh, Jewish community uh, was published. On um, September 1st, 1921, it was a Thursday, I remember that day. It was one year to, uh, to the day uh, after the establishment of uh, uh, Greater Lebanon. Um, the inaugural issue of uh, this Lebanese Jewish organ, its mission statement, uh, if you will, uh, paid tribute to what it viewed as the Lebanon of the Jews presenting itself to its readers as a Lebanese publication, but a publication for Jews. And for almost five decades, Al-Alam al-Israeli was unhindered, fulfilling its mandate and honoring its mission statement as a Jewish, but Lebanese periodical. I teach at a Jesuit university, and we like to say that we are a Catholic, but Jesuit university. So I don't know if you'll get the joke, but. Uh, stylistically, the newspaper, uh, its Arabic language was a weekly literary tour de force. Uh, it's it's uh, revealing um, a high level of erudition, not only in, in the way it was published and written, but also revealing what kind of um, uh, what kind of people read it? So people who had to be highly educated. I mean, I read it with a dictionary. So uh, it's not written for me, certainly it's written for intellectuals. Uh, <laughs> thematically, <laughs> thematically in terms of uh, substance and content and 
intellectual, creative, and political leanings. Uh, the newspaper delved into histories relevant to Lebanon and the Jews. It spoke a great deal about this alliance between uh, between uh, 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 peoples of uh, classical antiquity, uh, the the Jews and the Maronite. Uh, I'm sorry, the Jews and the Phoenicians, and the Maronites of Lebanon was particularly sensitive to uh, these kinds of stories. Uh, the newspaper also headlined uh, cutting-edge rubrics on literature, the revival of Arabic belles the revival of uh, Hebrew language. Uh, it ran interviews with luminaries of the time, uh, Arab uh, not Arab nationalists, Lebanese nationalists, Zionists, some Arabic literary, literary figures. Uh, the, the list of names include uh, people such as uh, Jabotinsky, Achad Aam, uh, Chaim Weizmann, but also Taha Hussein, the doyen of modern Arabic literature. Uh, Prince Faisal was one of the people who were featured. Uh, what is interesting about the newspaper also is that it would um, uh, also uh, occasionally highlight uh, the works of rising local poets and young writers, among them many Jews. Uh, and incidentally, Al Alam al Israeli uh, was among the first, if not the first, Lebanese periodical in Arabic to have published the original text of the Lebanese national anthem in 1926, one year exactly before that text was officially adopted by the Lebanese government as the national anthem. So, this is to tell you about the uh, sort of uh, fusion between being Lebanese and being Jewish. It was uh, sort of complementary and it was in line with the way the Maronites in Lebanon thought uh, of the state they were creating. So, in that sense, the newspaper can be said to have uh, indeed lived up to its mission statement. It was unapologetically Jewish, it was unreservedly Lebanese, and when the circumstances demanded, it was obstinate in its determination that Jewish rights within the Lebanese polity be respected and protected. One decade into its journalistic life, Al Alam al Israeli inaugurated its National Day issue with a strongly worded editorial calling to task Arab nationalists and propagandists in Lebanon. It excoriated uh, local politicians who it saw that were doing the bidding of uh, Arab uh, doctrinaires and Arab nationalists who were willing uh, to sacrifice uh, the country's Jewish community for the sake of uh, compulsions at the newspaper, as the newspaper called them, compulsions alien to Lebanon's pluralist na nature. We should, it's a lengthy uh, quote, but I, I think it's worth reproducing for you. Um, why should there be a problem with Jews struggling for a place among the nations, began the editorial quote. Why is it a problem that, to some, that the Jewish nation is aiming to put an end to its exilic existence? Why is it a problem that Jews are uniting and unfurling their flag, flying it aloft like other nations? Why is it a problem that Jews are redeeming themselves and restoring their former dignity and glory? We Lebanese Jews shall continue furnishing every effort on behalf of Jewish dignity. We shall spare no sacrifice. We have struggled and we shall continue to struggle. We are and shall remain Jews, proud of our history and identity and the teachings of our fathers. But we are equally importantly Lebanese, living in a Lebanese homeland to whose dignity and prosperity we shall ever and forever struggle and aspire. There exists in Palestine today a motley crew of Arab leaders making trouble and instigating disorder and inciting violence. We in Lebanon are fighting against those criminals and we ask that our Arab brothers in Palestine and elsewhere recognize that their interests, as much as our own, remain in working together hand in hand to keep those extremists at, at bay. Let us work, truly work together to moderate the hearts and actively take part in construction, not destruction." End quote. But the world, and with it the Middle East, was undergoing rapid transformation during the late 1930s and early 1940s, and conciliatory uh, Lebanese Jewish voices were, it seems, blowing in a broken bagpipe. Yet, Notwithstanding these changes of fortune, both uh, for Lebanon itself and uh, Lebanese Jews, Lebanon would still try clinging to its perception of itself as a confederation of minorities, a place unencumbered by what it called the Arab's identity politics and the resentments of an Arab-Israeli conflict in the making. 
Lebanon, in the words of one Maronite politician of the time, uh, uh, he said, it ought to remain a sanctuary that is neither Christian, nor Muslim, nor Jewish, but rather a homeland of liberty and freedom and humanism. The sentiment was echoed by Jewish community leaders throughout the 1930s and 1940s, often bragging about the age-old Jewish affiliation with a pluralist Lebanon. For us Jews, noted one leader, our attachment to Lebanon is not a modern phenomenon. Quote, it has existed for thousands of years. Already Moses solicited God's favor to see the promised land, the enchanting Lebanon. Later, our biblical poets celebrated the marvelous sites, the majestic cedars, which Solomon preferred for building the eternal temple. Time has not diminished our attachment to our land. It has nothing but strengthened our loyalty and devotion to Lebanon as a homeland of liberty and justice for all its citizens without distinction of race or confession." End quote. Uh, Maronite uh, uh, Patriarch Anthony Arida, whom I mentioned earlier, who was known locally as the Patriarch of the Jews, likewise never missed an opportunity to show affection towards Lebanese Jews, but also to offend Arab nationalist sentiments publicly speaking his commitment to Jewish rights in Lebanon proper and beyond. Throughout the 30s and 40s during pastoral visits to his flocks and to Jewish community centers in Lebanon, Arida strongly denounced Nazi Germany and its local sympathizers. Uh, in many instances, uh, he addressed encyclicals to Maronite churches around the world, calling on the faithful to dedicate Sunday masses and homilies to the Jews. Hitler's Germany has distorted Christian teachings, came one of the patriarchs' encyclicals. Quote, he said, The Jews' only sin in the eyes of this Germany has been simply their being Jewish. Where are in all of this those Arabs and Muslims who noisily brag about their so-called admiration for freedom of conscience and religion? They ought never forget that the Jews are our brothers in humanity and that Almighty God has chosen them and no one else as keepers of his divine oneness and his eternal truth." End quote. The patriarch's messages uh, had particular resonance and often generated almost euphoria uh, among the Jews of Lebanon, uh, but they were in line uh, with uh, the regular uh, memoranda and messages that he was issuing uh, during his term to various uh, uh, Lebanese, French, and Jewish organizations. Um, he uh, was uh, repeatedly suggesting that uh, uh, Jews fleeing Europe be settled uh, in uh, Lebanon. Uh, and this mounted as restrictions were being placed on uh, Jewish immigration to British Mandate Palestine. Many in the local uh, Arabic language uh, press denounced uh, the patriarch's favorable public stance vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. This question of uh, someone's compassionate attitude vis-a-vis -vis the Jews, a Maronite uh, prelate to boot in an Arab-defined uh, Middle East daring to lend public support to Jews was considered uh, so inflammatory that rumors began circulating in the Arabic press suggesting a mutiny within Maronite ranks uh, condemning uh, Arida the patriarch as a patriarch of the Jews who was shirking his uh, duties to his own community. I don't know how that would have been, but that was, uh, that was so some of the stories being run in the newspapers. Now, some of those negative uh, campaigns uh, also included stories often often reading uh, like pages straight out of the protocols, suggesting a Jewish cabal whereby, quote, in one story, massive swarms of Jewish immigrants were descending on Tripoli. Tripoli is a Sunni-dominated port city in northern Lebanon. So massive swarms of Jews, uh, Jewish immigrants, were descending upon Tripoli, embarking on large-scale land purchases. At least they were not just taking possession of the land. They were buying them. Um, and secretly meeting, uh, uh, plotting in Beirut's swanky St. George's Hotel, they were plotting uh, for their upcoming moves to conquer and dominate Lebanon and Syria." End quote. Now, these uh, kinds of stories 
compelled the patriarch to double down on his appeals that Jews be settled in Lebanon. He also publicly denounced Arab nationalists, demanding that they literally, and I quote here, I put it in bold, get off the backs of the Jews already, end quote. Uh, but Arab nationalism uh, was on the rise during the 40s. Lebanese particularism was in decline. And France, the protector of uh, Lebanon specificity, was being eclipsed as a world power. It was no longer able to inspire, influence, and lead. Uh, the British were now calling the shots in the Levant, and France uh, had at best uh, devolved into a junior partner, yielding to Great Britain's uh, Arab nationalist sympathies. Uh, subsequently, Lebanon would gain uh, independence um, at the end of World War II and would begin getting uh, sucked deeper into the orbit and resentments of Arab nationalism, uh, losing its position as a, a haven for minorities. This was incidentally also a time period during which the infamous Hajj Amin al Husseini had taken refuge in Lebanon in the Maronite coastal town of Junia, to be exact, um, given, him, uh, given him somewhat of a strategic and psychological symbolic pulpit from which to preach uh, his gospel. Uh, during this time period, um, excerpts of the protocols uh, began appearing in the Lebanese press, sometimes given uh, as free supplements to otherwise legitimate uh, publications. Um, Yet in spite of uh, mounting hatred and in spite of having resigned themselves to an apolitical path, the Lebanese Jews during that time period still made attempts at speaking truth to power and still pointed their, mainly their pen in their newspaper in the direction of those defaming Lebanese uh, and other Near Eastern Jews. Uh, we are here to defend the persecuted, whatever their creed, came uh, one exceptionally political editorial in a now heavily censored uh, Lebanese Jewish newspaper. It said, quote, but above all, we are here to defend the oppressed Jew because the Jew is a human being with rights no less legitimate than those of others. We are indeed more qualified than others to speak on behalf of Near Eastern Jewry for the simple reason that non-Jews in countries mired in intolerance and hatred are seldom willing to take up the defense of their Jewish countrymen. We may be minorities in this Middle East, but we are a vibrant minority. Indeed, we are the heartbeat of all minorities in these lands of the Arabs. We speak the language of the Arabs, and under the domination of Arabs, we ought to be allowed our free press to express our own opinions and our own enlightenment and our own feelings towards the lands of our fathers in the language of the countries ruling over us. Alas, we have become an easy prey, targets of ignorant fanatics, targets of hack journalists, regaling themselves and their readers with anti-Jewish campaigns in a press world of mercenary journalists for hire. Uh, our journalistic inertia can unfortunately turn into intellectual death. This is precisely what opened the door to deceitful, fraudulent journalists to gratuitously demean and abuse us. The weak shall no longer be the scapegoat of the bully and oppressor. We shall fight for our rights and our history. And let it be known that our journal is not the mouthpiece of anyone or any political party. It is the mouthpiece of truth and fairness and justice. And come what may, we shall always and with all of our strength and determination remain defenders of all of these values, which are ultimately the very principles and foundations of human values. Does I mentioned earlier the Arabists, uh, Arab nationalism was mounting and the Arabists' attacks on the Jews of Lebanon uh, would not relent and soon they will begin taking the form of uh, physical attacks, uh, economic attacks in addition to what was being perpetrated in the media. And yet Jewish presence and uh, history and ascendancy in Lebanon continued in, in fits and starts throughout the World War II uh, era and its aftermath. Uh, and actually Jewish presence uh, swelled after World War II, swelled after the only uh, country in the Middle East 
uh, besides Israel that saw a growth in its Jewish population is uh, actually Lebanon. So in addition to European Jews that, that the Maronites had managed to settle in their areas, uh, Jews coming from Aleppo, Damascus, and Baghdad also came to swell uh, the numbers of uh, Lebanese Jews. And so it was not World War II, uh, nor was the establishment of the State of Israel, nor was the eventual loss of Lebanon specificity as a refuge for minorities that would lead to the uh, etiolation of uh, Lebanese Jewish life. It was the 1970s. Uh, that would do that, the rise of the Palestine Liberation Organization as a major uh, political and military force in the region, the PLO's inauguration of a state within a state in Lebanon, and the attendant extortionism and loss of sovereignty that would ensue. Thus, the idea of this entrepot and crossroads for peoples and ideas uh, would die uh, in uh, the 1970s, putting Lebanon within the, 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 the uh, uh, context of the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. My people are at war with my country is an adage that is often attributed to Arab Israelis uh, who, all things considered, might have done pretty well for themselves without an Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, with some tweaking, I suggest uh, that there may be no better adage than the above illustrating the predicament of Lebanese Jewish life. If I may, in conclusion, I want to read a uh, piece of a recent uh, novel uh, published by a francophone uh, Lebanese novelist, Amin Malouf, titled Les, Les, Les Désorientés, The Unhinged. And I think it en encapsulates the... Um, the status of uh, Lebanese Jews, um, and uh, th their, their final uh, exodus uh, from Lebanon. Uh, Lebanese of Malouf's generation, many of them uh, Jews, proudly upheld ideals of diversity and uh, urbane multiculturalism and sophistication. We were young, noted Malouf, uh, uh, in the name of his generation. Uh, the ethnic mosaic that was Lebanon had been the dawn of our lives, uh, but the dawn was turning to twilight. War was coming, inching closer, he wrote, quote, slowly crawling in our direction like a radioactive cloud. We had no time to stop it. We had only time to flee. Our country, with its delicate system of power sharing, was drowning, and it would soon rapidly go unhinged. And so we discovered in the middle of the flood water submerging us that Lebanon was irreparable. The first of my friends to flee was Naim. His entire family, his mother, father, two sisters, and grandmother all left quietly, quickly. They were certainly not the last remaining Jews in the country but they surely were part of a small dwindling minority which up until then had resisted abdication. In the 1950s and 60s, we witnessed a muted hemorrhaging of Lebanon's Jews. In a slow drip, without much fanfare, the community had begun melting away. Some of its members had gone to Israel by way of Paris, Istanbul, Athens, or Nicosia. Others chose to settle in Canada, the United States, England, or France. Naim's family opted for Brazil, but they left relatively late in the game in 1973. Thank you.